In 2001, members of Congress thought that I should be fired because I dared suggest that how we were building America might be bad for our health, might be making us overweight, unfit, depressed, and lonely. In epidemiology, we call it a common source epidemic. When everyone begins to develop the same set of symptoms, it's not something in their mind, it's something in our environment that is changing our health. How many of you are taking medicine for asthma? It was a time when all three of us had an asthma attack at the same time. I mean, it got to the point where I had to choose which one of us was going to get on a machine first. To see your son not be able to take a breath is one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. Went in for some treatment. They said I was going to take my foot off. <laughs> Diabetes, not a good thing to fool around with. We're seeing more of these problems in young children now. It used to be a problem of adulthood, and we're seeing this in children, you know, 11, 12 years old, which was not a problem we were seeing maybe 15, 20 years ago. I think we are looking at the first generation in American history to live less long than their parents. This is shocking. Differences in life expectancy between uh, the, the, the poorest neighborhoods and the wealthiest neighborhoods exceed 10 years. And we tell people in our county, Give me your address, I'll tell you how long you live. What you're about to see could literally save your life. As we trace links between our growing national health crisis and many unhealthy city and suburban design decisions, we're going to meet people in communities who struggle with these issues. I felt very compelled to stay and to be a part of the solution and I hope that I have been a part of the solution for the last 27 years. If one person in the whole world comes to me and says to me, I've changed because of you. That would totally make my life. We will see how some are correcting past mistakes with stunning results, transformations that you can apply to your own neighborhood. We think that one of the ways to address this problem is by having small-scale urban organic farms right in the city. There has never been a medicine as good as the Daily Walk. Uh, in fact, anyone who has to have medicine can take less medicine over time if they walk, exercise, and live an active life. It's the only way that we start to see a return of the retail life of the street, the social life of the street, as well as the health of the people. If you create the infrastructure, you create the opportunity in the built environment for people to do something different than driving by themselves, even in a place like Atlanta that loves their car, we thought people would change their behavior. And they might actually like the opportunity of walking to work, walking to lunch, doing errands on foot. You need to do is make sure that the place in which you live and your people live are as nice as the places they would dream about visiting. And that's what public spaces and public health means to me. And they, and they go together. When you come home, you want to feel a sense of haven. And that's what people feel here. We can create environments that work very well for people and make us healthier, or we can ignore it at our peril. Join me, Dr. Richard Jackson, on a quest to improve the quality of all of our lives by designing healthy communities. So the uh, four-hour video series has been shown in about two million homes on PBS around the country. Um, and it actually has not shown in New York City yet, and I was pleased to learn that WNET Channel 13, which is a big station that covers uh, almost 40 million people, will show um, actually six hours. There will be two more hours of New York-focused uh, video as well. Uh, the DVD is owned by the producers, the Media Policy Center, but I would like to give as a gift the, to the um, Tarrant County Health Department, to Lou Brewer, um, a set just for uh, use and borrowing, and uh, you can get some more if you need to somewhere else. Um, the book on the left is the textbook I use at UCLA. It's got lots of references. When I teach my class, I've got half um, public health students and half planning and architecture students. And in the second class, we have speed dating. And we give them two minutes apiece, and they have to identify someone from the other school that they will then do their joint presentation with. And it's really been a lot of fun. And, and actually, there have been a few romances out of the whole thing. but. Um, <laughs> 
fact, my favorite was a student that, from planning who had designed a transit-oriented development uh, for part of Los Angeles, matched up with a student from public health, a young woman who was interested in violence prevention, and he ended up redrawing his entire development with lots more eyes on the street and sight lines with a view towards making it safer. And in a way, it's a metaphor for what we need to do because none of our disciplines have all the answers by ourselves. Um, they actually got married. The uh, <laughs> book on the other side, which Lou Brewer has, is uh, the companion book for the video series. The video series was an amazing gift. I ended up spending going to about 15 cities, spent three days in Detroit with two camera crews. Um, one of my favorite lines in the whole series is where the mayor of Charleston says, Joe Riley, we ought to build places that are just as nice as places that people would want to visit. And in a way, you know, we spend a lot of time driving around getting to places other than where we live. And why can't we live in those places? So um, thank you so much for inviting me to a Vision North Texas. In the prophet Ezekiel says, without a vision, the people will perish. And I think that this cultural division part is so important. Yeah, you might have a bunch of Lego blocks at the end of it, but nevertheless, you've got to we've all got to have a vision and people can move forward to it. Um, that's the video series in WWW Designing Healthy Communities. So my grandson was born on October 11th of 2011, my first grandchild, named after my dad, who had been a fighter pilot who died very young. Um, and on that day, I was so excited about this, and I the, opened up the Daily Bruin, the university newspaper at UCLA, and here's a full-page ad from General Motors. And GM is telling us they had done focus groups on college kids. And the ad was, reality sucks. And they clearly had very smart people on the other side of one-way mirrors listening to college kids talk about their lives and worrying about their jobs, worrying about their loans, worrying about getting back and forth to school. And so they converted this negative into an advertising campaign. But you can be happier because the college discount doesn't suck. And you can really be happy if you spend $22,000 on a GMC Sierra and take seven years to pay it off. And if you do, you can stop peddling, start driving, and pretty girls will not smirk at you anymore while you're out there doing what's good for your health, good for congestion, good for air quality, and saves you money. Well, I was really upset, and I, I scanned it in, and I showed it in class a day or so later, and one of the uh, young women said, Dr. J, she's not smirking at him. She's flirting with him. She doesn't want to be with the chubby guy driving the car. But of course, GM is right, and the, you know, these advertising companies know what they're doing. Um, if you look at, and I'll show you some measures of the health of the U.S. population, it's pretty worrisome what's going on. A four-fold increase in the consumption of antidepressants for people in the prime of life just over the last 20 years. And I'll show you some more data on shifts in health status. The CDC, and I'll come back to some of this data, Interviews by phone, 200,000 people a year. It's called the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. And one of the most important questions you can ask somebody that will predict how long they're going to live is, how do you feel? How would you describe your health? And people would say, I feel great. My health is excellent. Live about 10 to 15 years longer than people would say, I really feel lousy. It's a very good, all this other stuff, it's a very good predictor just asking people how they feel. And here's the description of, People feeling, how many days did you feel unhealthy? And over time, we've seen an increase in the number of Americans saying, I don't feel good. We also do in-person interviews of about four to 5,000 people per year. Now, I'm a pediatrician, and if you've taken your child or grandchild to the pediatrician, one of the first things they do is weigh the child, get the height. And they plot it out on this chart. And you want your child or grandchild to have, you know, if their 50th percentile for height you want them to be somewhere around the 50th percentile for weight. You don't want them too low, of course, and you don't want them too high. You want them to be tracking right along in their proper percentile. Child comes in, he's probably be about a 10-year-old, 50th percentile for height, 95th percentile for weight. 
If you're overweight, your blood pressure is almost always too high. Your cholesterol is often too high. Your blood sugar can be too high. And uh, the child has a signs of depression. I made up this case, but I will, if I had a room full of pediatricians and I said, how many of you have seen a child like this in the last day? Everybody would raise their hand. Somebody would say, I've seen five of them in the last day. Um, this is the modern American child in many parts of the US. Now, a good pediatrician is not going to say, um, here, uh, take these medicines, these diet pills, and you'll get better. Um, a good one would say, well, get the screen, get the television out of the bedroom. No soft drinks in the house. Really make the snacks things that are fruit and, and, and healthy. Um, try and get into an exercise program at school. And Ed Sanchez, two months later, the child comes back, and what's changed? Exactly right. He's lost about one pound. He probably was fasting before he came to see you. But he can't change the food at school. He can't really walk to school because of the design of the neighborhood. And two months after that, he's taking something for his cholesterol, his blood sugar. And we're spending about $400 a month because we are medically treating what I will assert, my friends at Urban Land Institute and Architects, we are medically treating what is in fact an environmental problem and in many ways a, a cultural problem that we have created. Now this medicalization of a broader set of problems has had real impacts on um, the cost of everything. The, the environment is rigged against the patient and it's rigged against the doctor. And it's very hard for a lot of the docs and nurses that at the end of the disease pipeline to be sitting there and trying to take care of people when in fact the causes are way upstream. Which is why more and more of us in public health are talking about health in all policies. The transportation policy is health policy. Agriculture policy is health policy. Economic policy is health policy. Tax policy is health policy. And sitting there in a white coat is not going to really intervene with the problems that we're having. I ran an event when I was a medical student on the skyrocketing cost of health care. We are really worried about the skyrocketing cost of health care. And in 1970, the skyrocketing cost of health care was 7% of the GDP of the United States. In 1990, and I'll come back to 1990, it's about 12%. And we're at 18 point something percent of all the money in the United States now going to medical care. As someone pointed out, Russia collapsed because they started spending too much money in their economy on one thing. In that case, it was military. Um, I think if we continue to spend so much of our economy just on medical care, we are going to have the same set of, we are having the same set of problems. Well, you'd think if we spent this much money, golly, we must be the healthiest people in the world. It must be great. And we're number 49 in life expectancy. My son, who is now a physician um, at CDC, uh, in, during high school and college, we would send him, uh, all of our kids, uh, to developing countries to do various kinds of work. And he sent me, called or sent me an email from Costa Rica about eight, ten years ago, and he said, Dad, these people spend seven times fewer dollars on medical care and health care than we do in the U.S., and their life expectancy is exactly the same as the United States. And, it, it, you know, I could have given him all the lectures in the world, and this really hit him. Wow, and, and Costa Rica spends a lot on prevention and public health. Now, thank God we live about 30 years longer than our great-great-grandparents did. If you were born in about 1890, 1880, your life expectancy was 30 years less than it is today uh, for most of us born today. How much of that came from medical care, this 17, 18% of all the money we spend, and how much came from two big eyes. The two big eyes are immunization and infrastructure. How much from medical care and how much from immunization and infrastructure? Five years of the 30 years came from medical care and the rest came from immunization has been hugely important, but infrastructure meant we weren't crowded into homes that were unheated and uncool. We had more space. We had, and I would argue that uh, healthy food better, safer transportation. This is all things that have improved our lives profoundly. So um, after spending about, oh, I lived in California for about 25 years, and uh, I was offered what was in essence a job in the Supreme Court of Public Health. I was offered a job as a director of the National Center for Environmental Health, arguably the 
highest in health and environment job in the country. And um, it was really hard, and <laughs> apropos of news, um, in the first hour on the job, they said, there's a cruise ship with people all with diarrhea and somebody died and what do you want to do? I said, I didn't know I had responsibility for cruise ships. Oh yeah, a bunch of congressmen got sick about 10 years ago and they gave CDC the disease oversight of all the cruise ships that come to the United States. You know, there were 400 people there. I didn't know there were cruise ship people. By the way, I'll t ask me later about cruise ship stories. I got a lot of them. And um, <laughs> the Queen Elizabeth had one called the Brown Cruise, and you can figure out what that was about. Um, but there were very hard parts of this job, too, which was uh, we oversaw the destruction of the chemical weapons of the United States government. We, we dealt with a lot of downwind radiation sites. We did lots of epidemic investigations, cancer clusters, birth defect clusters, and the rest. And over time, I, became, I, I started an asthma program, and I became convinced that a lot of our lung problems and our air pollution problems were about transportation and buildings. And that was about land use and urban planning. And I thought more and more about water pollution and all the stuff in water and what we were drinking. And it turned out that paving over the landscape meant we were destroying our water resources. And I kept coming back to urban planning all the time. So one day in 1999, the head of CDC, Jeff Copeland, called uh, all his directors in to talk about what were going to be the big killers in the 21st century. And I'm driving down Buford Highway, and some of you have been on Buford Highway. I know you have, Betsy, uh, in Atlanta. It's a parallel to Highway 78 or so, whatever. And it's seven lanes wide. And vehicles are supposed to be going 35 to 40. They're all going 50 to 60. It's a hot day, 95 degrees, 95% humidity. And I'm late for the meeting, of course. And uh, I'm thinking about, oh, the big threats. I've got to be prepared to talk about the big threats. And oh, well, climate change is a big threat. And chemicals and endocrine disruptors are big threats. And I look over to the side of the road, and here's this elderly woman walking along, and it's hot, and she's bent over the plastic shopping bag, one in each hand, and she's really struggling, and, and she's got red hair, and she looks like my mother, and I want to stop and give her a ride, and I, I don't do it. I go to my meeting, and we're talking big stuff, and I'm thinking, if she collapses and dies, the cause of death will be heat stroke, and it won't be absence of trees, absence of public transportation, absence of an infrastructure that makes her life easier. And if she's killed by a truck going by, it'll be motor vehicle trauma, and it won't be lack of sidewalks, <coughs> poor urban planning, failed political leadership, or for that matter, failure of a health vision for that area. And so I went back and I called my friend Howard Frumpkin, who's a co-author in the books. I said, Howie, I think we've been focused on the wrong stuff. We're focused on stuff real far away, like the planet's well-being, and focus real small, like molecules, but where people live is hugely influences people's health and well-being. And he said, I completely agree. Let's write a book, and, and we did. At that meeting, we came up with 10 big threats, and I'll touch on a couple of them because I think they're strongly related to how we build. I'm going to argue as we go along that some of the depression epidemic we're looking at is related to how we build. Um, certainly the inactivity, uh, lack of physical ability and um, overweight is related as well. In my class, I asked my students, we built two to three million of these in the United States every single year um, for before the bust, uh, probably for a good 10 to 12 years. What's the message, Dean, of this building? What's the, what is this saying that is the most important thing, Don, about the life of these people? Pardon me, you live there? No, I said that I have enough money to live. You're close. It's, it, it, does, it does imply wealth, but what else message? Yeah, the human, the human family is an appendage to where they keep their cars. And in a way, it's a metaphor. You know, 25% of the entire economy of the United States during the 20th century was related to automobiles, you know, highways, roads, gasoline, and the rest, but it was related to automobiles. And so we've centered our lives on cars. Here's a picture, we call this the New Jersey State Flower, but having been here for an, a couple hours, I think, I think this really does look a little more like, you have much more beautiful um, overpasses. I've never seen such beautiful overpasses in my, in my life. They're soaring. And, and uh, Chris Leinberger says, the affordable housing policy of the United States is drive until you qualify. 
And all the real estate people know this is true. So we build places that look like this. And um, imagine that you're eight years old and you live at the end of the, in New Jersey where I grew up, they call this a dead end, but now it's a cul-de-sac. Um, and your best friend lived over here and you correspond, you said, let's, let's get together and, okay, so I'll climb over the fence and pass the Doberman and the Rottweiler and the pervert and the guy with the gun and go over here. <laughs> and, um, and of course you don't do that. You, you get on your little bike and you bike all the way down and out to the big arterial and over the freeway and, and an hour and a half later you arrive at your friend's house 100 yards away. Well, of course you don't do that. What's the first um, word out of your mouth, do you think, Keith? Mom, drive me. So the women in this room drive twice as much as your mothers did, who drove twice as much as their mothers did, and we've basically been on this stair-step increase of driving. A lot of it, now, I'm the father of three now grown sons, but in some ways I didn't mind driving them uh, because if you have sons, especially teenage sons, and you have to have serious conversations, if you want to talk about drugs, sex, and the dominant social paradigm, it's better to be looking through the windshield. <laughs> Sex is a lot of fun. It's a lot like driving, but it's really a big responsibility. <laughs> be careful. If you spread out more, you drive more, uh, proven. So I'm a kid in New Jersey, one of seven kids in this house that had no air conditioning. And in 1955, on our black and white TV with about 10 kids in the house, we saw the opening of Disneyland. And it was really cool. They had Tomorrowland and Frontierland, and they had a place where you could pay $25 and go see people walk in front of storefronts on sidewalks and have Main Street USA. And, and, uh, but if you go back and watch that video, the camera pans back and you see Highway 5 going by in Anaheim. And there's fields all around it. Highway 5 had five cars on it, and it was a freeway. Well, why wouldn't anybody want to live in a place that only has five cars on the highway and they're free? So everybody, California is probably 7 million people then. It's 37 million people now. And this is what it looks like. This is Wilshire Boulevard, Highway 10. When I got to LA about four or five years ago, I thought I'd deal with my colleagues at USC all the time. I never go to USC because even though it's 15 miles away, it's about an hour and a half to get there, and um, it just isn't worth the trouble. I'd rather Skype or do something else. One of the things I teach my students, and this is really fairly, this is now a serious line. The built environment is social policy in concrete. So if you decide that those people, I don't want those people over there being too close to me, one way that people have dealt with this is run a freeway right between those two parts of town. So North Jersey, African-American part of town was here and they would run it right, the Garden State Parkway would run right through there um, and separate those two parts of town. We see this in Syracuse, we saw it in Hartford, we've seen it all around the US. By the way, it was never really intended that we would run highways through the middle of towns and cities. Um, it was basically local lobbying that had all that concrete poured there. This is Northwest Atlanta, and Northwest Atlanta did not want MARTA coming to Northwest Atlanta. And I remember being at a meeting where someone said, we don't want it because it brings in the wrong element. In fact, we think MARTA stands for, literally they said this, MARTA stands for moving African Americans rapidly through Atlanta. And it was, it was code. And, and Underneath a lot of things we do in America are other things that are going on. That was social policy. The trouble with this social policy is once you put it in place, you live with it for a century or more. And, and people then have to adapt to the physical environment that we've created. Um, this is Fred LeCall Olmsted, one of my heroes. That's Asheville over there, Betsy. And uh, he is the father of landscape architecture and he suffered from depression. And the way he dealt with his depression is he'd go to Europe and study beautiful um, parks and green space and would walk around. He felt that if we built places that welcome people, that nourish the soul, that gave us respite, he called the parks the lungs of the city, uh, we would do a lot for people's health. And I think in some ways, and I, I, he's one of my heroes because he did not understand what most modern doctors understand. Most modern doctors think that the 
you know, the, the head is separated from, I'm overstating this, but the head's separate from the body, the body's separate from everybody else's, which is separated from the physical environment we're in. And Olmsted would say it was all whole cloth. They are not separated. Uh, I'm gonna skip these, sorry. How we build affects how often we're injured. So, um, a little bit old, but I'm gonna tell the women in the audience, every man in this room believes that he is a better than average driver. <laughs> and we all sort of believe that accidents or injuries or crashes are the result of bad drivers, and a lot of times it is, but your biggest risk factor for getting killed when you're driving is just driving a lot. And the more miles you put on, the more lottery tickets you buy. So how many, how many miles do you have to drive to get a one in a million lottery ticket for dying in a pool of blood in the United States of America? That was a lot right there. In other words, what is your risk factor, what is your risk of, one in a million risk of dying at how many miles? In the US, it's about 80 miles. So there are people in this room that have bought two lottery tickets getting here and back for death. And yet, and if you ask the average American, who's more likely to die uh, from injuries, they would almost always say, oh, it's somebody living in downtown Oakland or New York or some city and yet it's usually the long distance commuter who has a much higher actual risk of dying. Um, you know, if the whole country had the same death rate as New York, we do this a lot in public health. We say, you know, if we could all be as good as somewhere, we'd save 24,000 lives. If we all were as, um, drove as much as they did and, and had the same injury rate as Portland, we'd save 15,000 lives. And if we had all the same injury rates as Atlanta, we'd kill 15,000 more people. So putting people in cars and making that the only way they can get around, you're many times safer in public transit than you are driving. How we build uh, affects the air and the water we drink. Uh, this computer disappeared. Ed, this is not a liver scan. This is the, this is the, dis the appearance of hard space and the disappearance of trees um, from Atlanta. So we've, re we've actually removed probably about one-seventh now of all the um, greenhouse gas increase that we've seen in my lifetime has been due to deforestation, just removing tree cover. Um, it erased my thing down here, but what it says is we have paved over, paved over 60,000 square miles of the United States of America. Doesn't have photosynthesis, doesn't produce oxygen. Um, part of it is tr uh, building covers, but a lot of it is, is just highway space. In fact, we have paved over just for parking lots alone the equivalent area of the island of Puerto Rico. That's a lot of impervious surfaces. If you have an impervious surface and it's hot and dry and stuff is falling out of the air, and this is in Atlanta, every time it rained, everything on that parking lot, the pollutants, the lead, the antifreeze, the grease, went into the Chattahoochee River, which was the main drinking water source for five million people. If you take out trees, you make it hotter. Trees, I would assert, is a health benefit. In fact, one of the things the health uh, insurance industry worries about is increasing rates of skin cancer in our population. I can't say that trees would produce, reduce a lot of skin cancer, but it's better to be in the shade than it is in the sun. Um, the young mom there talking about the difficulty and how scary it was to have her son uh, with asthma, we have seen just a dramatic increase in as well, a moderate a de increase in asthma in the U.S. Make me come back to that in the Q&A. But I want to talk about obesity. How many of you have seen the obesity slides from CDC, these maps? So about um, half the group, so I'll go very quickly. These are the most effective public health education tools I've seen in the last 20 years. Um, and one of the reasons they're effective is every politician and elected official is very good at reading maps. They're really good at reading maps. So Texas in 1997, 15 to 19% obese. 2004, over 25% obese. 2007, 2009, I think I have 2010. Um, so in Louisiana, over 30% of the population has a body mass index over 30. Now, Ed. I'm, I, I'll stop picking on you, I'm sorry. Um, this is the result of calling people up on the phone, 200,000 people a year, and asking, among other things, your height and your weight. What's the problem with that? 
Well, the researchers at Harvard went and interviewed people in person. And they said, how tall are you and how much do you weigh? They got just what you'd expect. And then they actually measured people. And the men were shorter than they admitted. And the women were heavier than they would have admitted. So this is the difference. So what I've shown you is the result of phone interviews. The reality is worse. The more time you spend in the car, the more likely you are to be obese. Black, white, young, old, male, female. Because I did environmental health one day for fun, I calculated how much jet fuel we, additional jet fuel we burned off between 1990 and the year 2000 by the fact that we gained 10 pounds during that period of time. And it came out to a one and a half billion dollars worth of additional jet fuel because everybody was 10 pounds heavier. Uh, Andy Dannenberg and I wrote a little thing, we put it in the news, and um, it was the only report I ever did that was cited by Jay Leno, who that night said, CDC reports we're burning more jet fuel because we've all gained weight. Now I know why they don't feed us on airplanes anymore. Boring slide, but all it's really saying is, and this is, it's really important, is people say, oh, you're picking on individuals who are obese. When I presented, I was state health officer answering to Governor Schwarzenegger, when I presented the obesity and issues, um, he said, well, obesity, that's a, a personal decision. I was a puny guy in Bavaria, and then I became Mr. Universe. He didn't say that to me. I'm always kidding. But, you know, it, somewhere in the American consciousness is, if you just have enough willpower and you deal with yourself, what everybody else does doesn't matter. But in fact, we are enormously affected by what everybody else is doing. Watch Mad Men and everybody else is smoking and drinking martinis. You're a lot more likely to go out to lunch and have a cigarette and a martini than you would if you worked for Lou Brewer. And uh, what this is showing is if you shift a bell curve, a distribution curve in the population, even a few points in one way or another, the number of people that fall into the worry zone becomes enormously greater. Now this is bad news for clinical physicians because in clinical medicine, I spend my whole time focused on getting your blood pressure down. I do it one at a time. And yet if I got everybody, the whole population's blood pressure to drop five points, the number of people that would be in the worry zone would go down by millions. So that's why public interventions really work. Second boring slide, real important. As your weight goes up, by the way, I teach my students that pay attention to what's boring because it's often the most important stuff, like the Senate Rules Committee. <laughs> the Office of Management and Budget. God almighty, what could be more boring, right? Um, here's as your body mass index goes up, here's your risk of being diabetic if you're a man, and here's the risk of being diabetic if you're a woman. So if you're, bore, if you're obese, your risk as a man goes up seven times, and if for a woman it goes up for being diabetic 27 times. And if you're what we used to call morbidly obese or very, very obese, it goes up almost 100 times for a woman. So you saw the obesity slides. What do you think happens with the diabetes slides? Here's the US in 1994, Texas at about 6%. 2001, looks like still about six, and 2007. We now have states where one person in nine has a disease that will cost them their eyes, their kidneys, and their feet. We're now spending 2% of the entire GDP of the United States on just that one disease, diabetes. In fact, when I was a young pediatrician, we never saw a child in the pediatric clinic, diabetes clinic, with type 2 diabetes. We used, back then we called it adult onset diabetes. Now it's half the kids, you saw the doc, half the kids they're seeing now are type 2 adult onset diabetics. And some of the 17 year olds have heart failure and diseases that we used to see and normally see in 70 year olds. This report just came out last week, and I, this is a brand new slide, and they were comparing the health of my generation with the immediately generation, would be the Korean War generation that was before me. Um, the status of baby boomers health in the United States, the healthiest generation, question mark. CDC, remember I said they send around these vans and they examine about 4,000 people a year, questionnaires and 
um, blood work and uh, physical exam. So in 1990 or so versus 2010, people said, asked, are you in excellent health? 32% back then said they're in excellent health. 13% say they're in excellent health now. Remember I said the biggest predictor of how long somebody's going to live is if you say you're in excellent health. If you walk with assistance, do you need a wheelchair, a cane, a motorized wheelchair? These are people comparable age, same racial makeup, twice the percentage of people needing wheelchairs. And, and the costs are substantial when you start dealing with this. Are you limited at work? Increase there. Do you have functional limitations? Yes. So here's lifestyle factors. And obesity, of course, went up from 29% to 39%. Regular exercise dropped from 50% to 35%. Look at the third one down. Look at the third one down. No regular physical activity. 17%, um, it's too many negatives here. 17% said, I don't get any regular physical activity a generation ago. Now more than half say I get no regular physical activity. And it's okay to simply walk to a bus or a car to the park or go for a long walk. You don't need to be out doing heavy duty jogs. The rate we're going, we'll have, um, if we continue, 32 million people obese, but look at the forecast. The prevalence of people with a body mass index over 40, that's 100 pounds overweight, will be 11% of the US population. No matter what we do medically, we cannot cope with sitting at the end of the disease pipeline if one person in nine has a body mass index of that size. Now, some of this is focused in our poorest parts of our population. If you go to poor neighborhoods, it's often loaded with fast food places. Um, you've seen the you know, marketing of things that, I, I almost think we, I don't want to say it ought to be against the law, but my personal opinion, it ought to be against the law to sell something that in fact tastes pretty good. Human beings like salt, fat, sugar, um, but really are almost lethal for you. Oh, and the slide I made about um, the, uh, what was it called? The hamburger place in Las Vegas where the man died? Heart attack grill. There were 10,000 calories in that one hamburger. So I'm a free individual. I make my own decisions. I'm not influenced by whether people do. My students drove down um, Sunset Boulevard. They looked at the ads on Sunset Boulevard. You can see it's you know, alcohol and entertainment and products. Then they went through the poor neighborhood, La Brea and Hawthorne, and um, 35 billboards, and they tell you to Drink stuff that makes you stupid, eat stuff that makes you unhealthy, and then go get stomach stapling surgery to get yourself fixed after you've done everything we've told you to do. Well, that's only in, in poor neighborhoods. Well, in fact, during the Super Bowl, um, advertisers are spending $125,000 a second to tell you to eat stuff that makes you overweight and drink stuff that makes you not very smart or overweight. This is, I'm sorry, this is rather California. This is the interchange 100, 300 yards from where I live at UCLA. The California Transportation Department spent two and a half billion dollars redoing this interchange. I got to UCLA about two years ago and raised hell um, that there was no sidewalk and no bike route. And this highway separates where most of the people live from UCLA. Even if you want to go to the VA hospital a quarter mile away, you have to get in the car to get to the hospital to see patients there. This is the Keeling curve. Um, when I was born, the CO2 level of planet Earth was 300 parts per million. It's essentially 400 parts per million now, partly from removing trees, partly from uh, burning fossil fuels. Al Gore showed this picture of Greenland. You know, in his movie, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. That was how much melting there was over those years. Enough water comes off Greenland now, it melts um, every day to supply New York City's water needs for a year. That's how much water is disappearing from Greenland. And this is the first time in satellite history the entire top of Greenland turned to water. So I know this is unpopular in certain political circles. Well, you know, cancer is very unpopular in most medical circles, but we still have to accept that it exists. Um, in, I, 
am proud of my ASLA honorary membership. I love plants and gardens and the rest. Here is the hardiness zone that came out. And let's look at Texas. I guess we're in the yellow zone, to be zone seven back in 1990, North Texas. Um, what do you think it is only 16 years later? Yeah, it's moved up pretty much to eight. Um, and they're not working a political agenda. They're just telling you what plants to plant. Um, you know, Atlanta went from being the, its prior temperature to the same temperature as North Florida in just 16 years. I mean, it's a very short period of time. This is the first nine months of, of no, this is all of 2012, and Texas had the hottest year in its recorded history, temperature recorded history. This is Bloomberg News. These are business people now looking, and Global, um, Munich Re, uh, Zurich Re, the reinsurance companies are taking this, the smartest people in capitalism are taking this desperately seriously. So this is when I was the uh, personal guard for Governor Schwarzenegger and um, <laughs> protecting him. Now, it was an event where we wanted to have fruits and vegetables get some sort of price supports, because right now we give $14 billion a year in price supports for corn, soy, and commodities that people need to lead, eat less of, and we give no price supports for things that people need to eat more of. And I don't want to get too much into the politics here, but it's, it's a very distorted system. In fact, in general, the stuff that isn't good for us is half as expensive in real dollars as 1980, and the stuff that is good for us is twice as expensive, and I, I have the data to document that. I'll skip these. Uh, the, the point of this is, it was about eating smart and good food and don't eat doof. And all of you know what doof is. Doof is food spelled backwards. And every kid ought to know if you eat too much doof, what you become. This is the advertising campaign. I can't resist putting it in because <coughs> from England. Um, you know, when we try and control alcohol consumption or reduce it, we tax it. When we try and reduce tobacco consumption, we tax it. I would argue that we ought to be taxing fructose consumption. Only your liver can metabolize fructose. Your brain can't use it, your muscles can't use it, your poor liver has got to consume all this stuff. And if somebody's going through a big gulp with 90, 900, uh, 90 ounces of, of sugar, you can't do it. It would raise a lot of money. Um, in, in any state, <clears throat> and if you did it in Texas, you shouldn't spend any of the taxes on adults or stomach stapling surgery. You ought to spend it on kids because if you really want to change behavior in a population, you've got to focus on safe routes to schools, um, school gardens. Kids ought to know where food comes from. Community gardens, and the gentleman that in Detroit, uh, Detroit's moving more and more to a lot of community gardens, and this was politically complicated because, and I talk to Malik. He said, you know, it's been hard for African Americans because our grandparents and great grandparents had to deal with the stigma of working on plantations and being in very difficult settings and to come back and have pride in what we're growing and to make money and to have meaningful community out of it was something I had to, by the way, if you're doing a city garden, it pretty much has to be an organic garden. You can't be doing industrial agriculture. <clears throat> Just to go back, this is the belt line in Atlanta and um, it we have a whole series on Atlanta where we call it Sprawl Atlanta, going from worst to first, and how to have a vision uh, in terms of the Beltline, parks, green space, walking routes to really create a city. When I was health officer, um, I argued that every town in California ought to have a farmer's market. And I got a lot of pushback. And the only things I worked hard on was to get the, we called them EBT cards, the, the food stamps usable in a farmer's market. That's the old rule about it. if it's boring, it's important. We finally got that approval so poor people could use it. Somebody said, well, just the rich people go to farmer's markets. And the truth is, poor people often go about noon because the prices have dropped because no farmer wants to take stuff home. Um, and the quality is just as good. I think Ed Sanchez was on this uh, Institute of Medicine Academy of Sciences Committee that talked about what we would do to stop the obesity epidemic. The very first intervention recommended, there were 10 interventions recommended, was folks in this room, communities, transportation officials, community planners, health professionals, and governments should make promotion of physical activity a priority by increasing accesses to places and opportunities for such activity. So when you deprive children, we deprive children of places to 
walk, play, have green space, be active and socialize, we're depriving them not just of liberty, but also of life and the pursuit of happiness. You all know this is true. Dramatic decrease in kids walking and biking to school over a generation. Do you, do you require the fitness gram in Texas? Yes. Good for you. I, you know, one of the things that works well is to get the schools to compete over who's got the highest percentage of kids that can pass the fitness exam. I don't believe in putting, you may do it, but I don't believe in putting the body mass index on the report card. But you can do something about fitness, and that ought to be on the report card, and parents ought to be paying attention to that. My kids went to a high school that looked like the one at the bottom. It still looks like a medium security high school, doesn't it? I mean, you know. I'll skip this. Kids need to walk to school. You walk to school, you learn better, behave better, socialize better. I used to collect um, stupid medical headlines. Uh, one of my favorite stupid headlines was, um, girls, teenage girls who get drunk a lot are more likely to get pregnant. And, and the other one, this was great. Um, children who, uh, hyperactive children that don't have a chance to run or walk around are more hyperactive. I'm not saying as well. Like, your grandmother told you that, right? Go outside and play. <laughs> Germany and Holland, how many of their short trips? Over 40% of their short trips are walked or biked. What do you think it is in the U.S.? That's 7%. Canada, with its marvelous weather, has more people um, walking and biking. Now, we, <laughs> it is documented, it is documented that people who own dogs get more exercise than people that don't. I'm not joking. Um, but sometimes you can avoid that. And my students often think that the only way to get exercise is to go to the gym. Um, but in truth, uh, you don't have to. Incidental exercise works as well. When I was young, we were kind of taught obesity is bad for us, but I was not taught fitness is bad. The difference between, if you become fit as a middle-aged man, from unfit to fit, you add about seven years of lifespan. It's almost as good as stopping smoking. And yet we don't uh, accommodate fitness. I'll skip this study. What's the best exercise as we age? Um, walking, uh, if you do 10,000 steps a day, it works better than any drug for preventing diabetes. Um, you, and if you need the drugs, you need the drugs. But people that do it for six months lose about 7% of their body weight and reduce their risk of becoming type 2 diabetic by about 50%. So um, all over the country, these bike places are appearing. And this is Washington, D.C., near Union Station. And you come out in this beautiful building, and you can rent a bike. And they don't have the infrastructure yet. I feel scared as can be trying to bike in Washington. Um, and the roads are kind of odd. L'Enfant, you know, he didn't think about this when he built the place. Well, I was there admiring the bikes. I had my camera out and I look over in the corner and here are two police vehicles. A Segway and a mountain bike. And I've always liked the idea of mountain bikes. I always talk to the officers on the mountain bike. Never talked to them in patrol cars for some reason. And um, so I thought, gee, I wonder how many calories you burn on a mountain bike versus a Segway and how much they cost. Well, it turns out one is about 10 times more expensive than the other, and one burns about three times as many calories as the other. And I particularly like this uh, comparison because the ad for the Segway versus the ad for the mountain bike, the cops in the Segway are fatter than the cops on the mountain bike. I'm going to skip these, sorry. You know, the Academy of Pediatrics writes guidelines for immunization and what kids should eat. This is the very first Academy of Pediatrics statement on what kind of neighborhood children should grow up in. And it says children need to be in neighborhoods that they have increasing ability to have autonomy, increasing ability to get around, be physically active, and to negotiate the world they're in. And we have a whole series in Smyrna, Georgia, where we're interviewing 14 and 15-year-old girls saying, I'm so bored because I can't do anything unless mom takes me somewhere. This is the hospital where I work. Uh, it was designed before. Um, they discovered stairways. And so to go to the second floor, you have to take the elevator. Um, actually, if I argue with the guard, he'll take me outside and unlock a door and let me go up the stairs. But then when I get to the next floor up, it's locked again. So I have to go back down again and get on the elevator. Um, one flight of stairs a day for a year is about a pound of body weight. 
That's not bad. We convinced Governor Schwarzenegger that all new state buildings ought to have pleasant and attractive stairways when you walk in, and it's one of the things I push very hard at CDC as well. Um, Kaiser Permanente, a big insurance plan in California, um, does a great job. They did this campaign about taking the path of most resistance. I just can't figure out how they got it approved by their safety people. <laughs> New York City has done a marvelous job. If somebody had said to me five years ago, you would be able to get on a bicycle and bicycle around Manhattan safely on bike routes, I would not have believed it. It is spectacular. And I want to commend Fort Worth and the wonderful Trinity River thing you're doing. I think you deserve a pat in the back. I think this is a wonderful vision. In fact, not only, you know, EPA says that every river and stream ought to be fishable, swimmable. I think every river and stream in America ought to be walkable or bikeable, I mean, right next to it. And you don't need to tell kids to be active if there's water around. They will do it. What does it take to make people happy? Well, a lot of Americans think that if you make more money, you become happier. Now, you're all smart people, so I don't think you believe it. And the truth is, if you look at happiness, it does go up as you get a bit more money. But once you are, you're warm enough and fed enough and you get your toothache taken care of and your medical care, you stop getting happier with more money. And um, you can, they teach you that at church, but here's the data that documents it. Um, being around people that we love. The human condition is sometimes we're depressed, sad, and lonely. We lose people we love. And the way we deal with very hard times in our lives is social events. We come together. We have food. We have music. We have ritual. And that's how we get through. So anything that takes away our ability to be together is depriving us of happiness. And what's the best antidote to depression? Yes, I'm talking about mild to moderate depression. Exercise, and especially in its document, exercise in green space and around nature and with sunlight. Sunlight makes your sleep hormone go down, the melatonin go down, and exercise makes your serotonin go up. That's, if you will, the happiness hormone uh, goes up. So ain't nothing better. So when you put that bike route in Fort Worth, you are, that's a depression antidote. You're saving money. Now, you, you probably do this, don't dump near the, the Trinity River. Um, and the Boy Scouts go around and they stencil these and the Girl Scouts stencil these. Well, I think we need to buy them new stencils. <laughs> Would you like to have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine along the Chinoge Freeway in downtown Seoul, South Korea? Doesn't that look appealing? Have your little kids run around right next to you? For the cost of $900 million, they ripped out the freeway that cut through their downtown and over the river that was there originally in place, and the creek that was there originally in place is why it was built. This is what they built. You don't need to tell the people in Korea to go for a walk. You don't need to tell kids to turn off the TV and run around for a while. And it is a place of human happiness and togetherness day and night. And you, know, you put things like, like this in place and crime goes down. The more working people that have something productive to do in their day, the fewer problems you have with crime and other kinds of issues. So uh, our child who had the obesity problem begins to walk to school about a mile each way, four days a week, um, saves the family car about 1,200 miles and $700 in gasoline, goes back to the dock at the end of two years, and he's burned off 40,000 calories per year. That's uh, 11 and a half pounds of body fat per year. He's now grown four inches. His weight's dropped to the 65th percentile. His blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar is normal. And he lives happily ever after because we've created places that encourage and enable people to be physically active, socialize, and lead their lives. And with that, I will stop. And thank you very much for your attention.